events uh, in the year of royal uh, for clergy. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much to Derek uh, for the hospitality. Huge biscuits from Tesco's, uh, one of the specialities that I was on here, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, and um, it's good to see so many of you. I wanted to and I have to say I was tempted to bump off this afternoon. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for having me here, and thank you for <laughs> coming on this very, very, very nice day. Um, it's an interesting introduction because you can make this claim about the Bible being a political agent, a political tool, about a number of different Bibles, of course. And what we see today is perhaps echoes of that past, uh, or perhaps even ongoing relevance in political discourse. And when I talk about politics today, I'm really... My mind is really on English political discourse. Now, English is specific because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have their very own distinct traditions here that don't quite match up to uh, what's going on in England. Although, of course, given the DUP's uh, <laughs> involvement in government, that might be about to change, but that's for another, for another time. Now, I'm going to talk about, really, with, I'm going to have one eye on the general election just gone. But before that, I want to give you a kind of potted history of the role of the Bible and religion in English political discourse, so we understand what's going on today. And Margaret Thatcher uh, was particularly influential in setting the template for what would follow in English political discourse, at least in mainstream English political discourse, party leaders, uh, Labour Party, Lib Dems and so on. And prior to Thatcher, the dominant model of understanding the Bible in mainstream uh, political discourse was that the Bible was equated something like with liberalism broadly understood. Freedom, democracy, tolerance, rule of law, that kind of thing. Now Thatcher inherited this, but gives it her own tweaks, to put it mildly, I think. And out of the 1960s, I mean, the 1960s gets remembered as a great moment for the, for the left and for, for liberals, but in many ways it was actually, I think, at least as pivotal 
for the right. Because Thatcher took all these kind of competing and contradictory notions of nostalgia, counterculture even, liberty, authority, anti-authority, and harnessed a lot of these ideas in the emerging Thatcherism as she overthrew the old Tory hierarchy and in the longer run developed an economic and social uh, views that would become profoundly influential in English political discourse up to the present. Now, if I was cynical, um, I would say her rediscovery of Methodism was used deliberately to promote this kind of uh, uh, new agenda. Of course, is a, you know, she starts off as a Methodist, becomes a Tory, then you have to be C of E then to be a Tory back in the 50s of course. <laughs> but she wanted to overthrow a lot of this and she doesn't leave the Church of England, but she does rediscover the Methodism in a strong way, a very strong way. And I think that's deliberate and a deliberate attempt at challenging the old hierarchies. But interestingly, she employs the Bible in a number of key speeches in the 70s and 80s. Perhaps the most famous is Sermon on the Mound, but there were, uh, there were other ones, other really significant ones in the 1970s as well. And the Bible for Thatcher was becoming, was presented at the very least as the source for developing Thatcherism. All the stuff about economic liberalism and individualism for Thatcher were grounded in the Bible, particularly, but not exclusively, in the New Testament. Um, the most famous example, I guess, is her use of the Good Samaritan. Um, some of you may remember the interview she did on Walden, and she repeated this on a number of occasions, that the Good Samaritan couldn't have helped the man if the Good Samaritan didn't have the personal wealth to do so. Uh, and the Good Samaritan, from Thatcher onwards, becomes a, a continual reference point in English politics. There was, there's other ones. I mean, this is where, you know, I've got to keep my kind of critical distance as a historian, and so I'm doing my best. Um, the, the, um, Jesus' death, the crucifixion. Jesus chose to die, just as you can choose. Your school, healthcare, this kind of thing. Um, you know, often when I do these kinds of talks, I kind of preface it by saying, I know you've all kind of... Um, doing your kind of learned theology, biblical studies and things like that. So you forget all that for now, okay? You know, uh, that's not important if you want to understand what the Bible's doing in English political discourse. Now, there was a other big point to this for Thatcher, was that the Bible and her construction and understanding of religion were all about the individual, not about anything that's might have smacked of socialism at all. It's all about the importance of the individual and entrepreneurialism and things like this. And it was a deliberate construction to challenge Marxism, socialism, welfare, too much dependency on the welfare state, uh, and of course the Labour Party. Uh, so this was in so, so when there was anything like terror attacks or violence in the name of religion, she would say, that's not really religion, that's a distortion of religion. But if it was done in the name of Marxism, for instance, you'd say, that is Marxism. That's the logical consequence of Marxism. It's terror, violence, and so on. And, I mean, again, I'm cutting a, a, a long story short. Poor old John Major often gets left out of the histories, and he will do again today. Um, but once we get to New Labour, already in the early 90s, as this movement starting to develop with Tony Blair and uh, people close to him, the Bible is being read in ways that Thatcher would have found acceptable. They're trying to come to terms with Thatcherism and incorporate Thatcherism and Thatcher's reading of the Bible um, in, uh, in relation to this new emerging uh, consensus, economic consensus. And so Tony Blair does this, but what Tony Blair also adds is what we might call a socially liberal qualification. So for Tony Blair, something like gay marriage or equality agenda, these are also grounded in the Bible. Thatcher didn't push these things uh, too hard, but Blair really pushed this. So on, so on the one hand, we've got Thatcher's sort of economic liberalism, and now we've got Blair's social liberalism, and they're brought together in this sense. But what Blair also does is bring Islam into the conversation. Um, it's not unprecedented, but the scale and levels of which Islam appears in English political discourses jumps sharply when we get to Tony Blair. And of course, after September the 11th, even more so, he claimed to read the Quran every day, for instance. 
And Blair does the same with, the, with Islam. Islam at heart must be compatible with liberal democracy. That's what true Islam is. Anything else is a distortion of Islam. Likewise with Christianity. At heart, it's a liberal, tolerant, democrat democratic, uh, democratic, but anything that isn't is a distortion of that for Blair. Now, that's, that'll become important later on. The other thing that's important uh, that Blair does is that he really or seems to kill off the old socialist reading of the Bible. Uh, now, the Labour Party, of course, owes much of its history to nonconformity. Now, he doesn't want to get rid of that notion that there's a, a, a Christian past to the Labour Party, but he wants to make sure it's read what, in ways he would see as correctly. So, um, the old tradition associated with people like Tony Benn, that the Bible is about um, equality, overthrowing uh, rulers, or that there's going to be an apocalyptic transformation of the present in a new Jerusalem, Blair wants to rewrite this. And it's very strong in the Labour Party at this, this point, but Blair uses it very interestingly, and um, not necessarily agreeably, but interestingly. And what he does, for instance, at the Labour Party conference in 2001 is he alludes to very clearly the 1945 Labour Manifesto about, when, about the founding of the NHS, development of welfare state, using the language of revelation you know, uh, about overcoming want, squalor and all this kind of thing. And he reapplies this to the invasion of Afghanistan, the forthcoming invasion of Afghanistan. So instead of this kind of apocalyptic transformation of the present here in the UK with all its socialist overtones, he says we must bring, well he wouldn't use New Jerusalem of course in this context, but we must bring apocalyptic change to uh, Afghanistan. And he does the same in, uh, incidentally in his speech on the eve of the Iraq war. He uses that language. Interestingly the press don't pick up on this, they have no idea of this language of course, it's just, just, but it's there for a jittery Labour Party, those with ears to hear. Now, that model, though, became, seemed to be the end of it. That seemed to have just embedded itself in English political discourse. And David Cameron, if anything, intensified it. He, on, the, uh, on the economic side, he argued that Jesus founded big society 2,000 years ago. And when he came to issues like food banks and the floods a couple of years ago, Instead of food banks being a bad thing, he implied, they're a good thing. This is big society in action, he would say. This is where the church should come in and do good. That's the kind of thing we should be celebrating. Of course, we all know that churches have had different responses to that. Floods, you'll be pleased to hear, he was particularly impressed with vicars canoeing to help people. This isn't the state, this is big society in action. So you, you know your role next time anything like this happens. And that seemed, I mean, it just seemed to be the final uh, entrenchment of the sort of Thatcher, Blair reading of the Bible. But the crash, I think, the 2008 crash has really opened up the ways in which the Bible is understood now in English politics, both on the right and on the left. And there were already hints of this with the Occupy movement. And you probably can't see the picture too well. Um, but the Occupy movement in London and, and elsewhere, incidentally, consistently used Jesus in the temple. Uh, and th this one says, I threw the money lenders out for a reason. Because we all know the location of this um, by St. Paul's and uh, the city. So this became a repeated image in, in Occupy. Russell Brand, interestingly, kept referring to Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, in his defense of a more uh, socialist reading of politics and religion. The problem with Russell Brand in media terms, well, I mean, uh, was that he kept referring to things that seemed a bit too Eastern, not English, and was never taken seriously. However, Jeremy Corbyn was in this respect. For all the criticisms levelled at Corbyn in the press, one, th one area where he's had a degree of protection has been the kind of uh, socialist Christian, Christian socialist tradition he's placed himself in. 
not that he's necessarily a believer, but he's, he's almost immediately located himself in the tradition of these radical readings of the Bible via Tony Benn, via the non-conformist tradition. Um, we'll come back to that a little later on as well. Also, is, I, I mentioned Kat Smith because she's from Barrow in Furness. And uh, uh, she said uh, quite openly on a number of occasions that Jesus, is a, Jesus was a radical socialist, which is quite unusual for a Labour front bencher, uh, 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 say five years ago even. On the other hand, we've also had it opened up on the right. Now, I've put Brexit on the right. Brexit is far more complicated than this. I think Brexit has um, uh, tendencies on the left as well, but it's certainly been associated with uh, issues of um, immigration and issues on the right in particular. And I, I, I've done quite a bit of work on the far right on this, and there are, it's not that common, but it's repeated that um, have tried to construct the Bible and Christianity in relation to Islam, as Islam doesn't belong, we're a Christian country. Um, very unlikely these people ever go to church or anything do this, but we're a Christian country, it's our culture, Islam, Muslims are not. And this may seem like a fringe thing, but actually in the media, it's a continual discourse. So um, there's been a few studies of this done now, and for instance, Islam is mentioned, and Muslims are mentioned 33 times a day in the national press over the past 15 years or so. Almost always in relation to something like terror and violence. And that's been <coughs> repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, for instance, one of the studies putting the key word Islam uh, and Muslim, and then check the articles, and the words terror and violence came up more than Islam and Muslim in those articles. So that's playing into all this as well. Okay, so we're, we're kind of up to the present now. And <coughs> Theresa May. I'll read them out, so don't worry if you can't see these. Now, in September 2016, uh, there was a discussion of British laws, cultures, values and traditions, such as Christmas. And Theresa May stated in Parliament that, I'll quote from here now, what we want to see in our society is tolerance and understanding. We want minority communities to be able to recognise and stand up for their traditions, but we also want to be able to stand up for our traditions generally, and that includes Christmas. So why might this be distinctive? Well, a year earlier, David Cameron uh, made nostalgic claims of Britain as a Christian <coughs> country. And he singled out the values that Jesus' birth represents. Peace, mercy, goodwill, and above all, hope. But it's because of these important religious roots and Christian values, he said, that Britain has been such a successful home to people of all faiths and none. Now, this is a particularly favoured term of Cameron. Whenever he talked about it, England or Britain as a Christian country, he would also say that this is, these are also the values of all faiths and none, very consistently. Elsewhere, these British values of all faiths and none were thought to be found in the Bible and Christian history, <coughs> including his speech on the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, where he said that they could variously include human rights, equality, monarchy, parliamentary democracy, protest, freedom, abolition of slavery, emancipation of women, responsibility, hard work, charity, compassion, humility, self-sacrifice, love, pride in working for the common good, honouring social obligations to one another, and the first forms of welfare provision. Very interesting inclusion, I think. Not the welfare state. Now, we might say that this um, rhetoric belongs to the sort of pre-Trump, pre-Brexit liberal embrace of others without inclusion or at least mention of anything too problematic or too illiberal or too unpalatable otherness in liberal multicultural discourse. But in a world of Brexit and Trump, May's rhetoric becomes blunt in identifying the other and in identifying difference but seemingly left open without too much explicit judgment. Now we'll note here that in May's response, the strong distinction is between minorities, their traditions, and the assumption of a normative British identity, which, well, what is it? It's not necessarily openly white as such, but then our traditions are not Diwali and they're not 
Eid. And it was in the dis uh, context of a discussion of Diwali and Eid that these comments were made by Theresa May. And so the Brexit-inspired othering of those deemed to be Asian minorities is perhaps clear. And this flirting with a sort of nativist construction of Christmas is unsurprising in uh, her early, early months of her premiership, when it was a red, white and blue Brexit, a desire to deal with the electoral threat of UKIP, an influential cohort of Leave MPs on the back benches, and most tellingly, a Conservative government floating the idea of companies identifying non-British workers. But Cameron, David Cameron had two further distinctive aspects, either downplayed or replaced in May's Christmas messages. First, Cameron's Christmas was part of his intensification of an inherited liberal economic view about Christianity and the Bible that he had received from Thatcher. And this is where Cameron placed his strong emphasis on uh, services being provided by beyond the state, Vickers Canoeing, Big Society, that kind of thing. Now, uh, what we get is something quite different with me. It's very, very muted, this. Now, this is not to say that Theresa May is plotting the downfall of capitalism or the like. But it rep what she represents, I think, is a post-Brexit political expediency of ap appealing to the elusive Brexit voter, put crudely, the pro-NHS, pro-decent wage, prioritising British vulnerable, vulnerables, anxiety about immigration, dislike for liberal elite politicians, and so on. This was an early emphasis of May's rhetoric, and I think it's factoring in to her understanding of Christmas and Christianity. Now, there's plenty more that could be said about May's understanding of minorities and about her understanding of Muslims and Islam and her use of what she, uh, the very common political trope of the perversion of Islam to denote terrorists. She also plays into the far right while since simultaneously distancing herself from them. But for now, I think this snippet can give some indication of an overall post-Brexit electoral strategy designed to colonise the right, gain even more enthusiastic support from the right-wing press, satisfy conservative Brexiteers and traditional voters, while not being blunt enough to isolate the more liberal conservatives and sympathisers, some of whom were uh, presumably happy enough to hold their nose and vote accordingly, though maybe not in red Kensington. But it was also a strategy designed to pick up an often older working class vote in post-industrial era of precarious employment and poverty, disillusioned with their economic lot and perceived to be abandoned by mainstream politics, particularly the Labour Party, where anti-immigration, anti-EU and anti-Muslim rhetoric has some support and where the far right, particularly the in, uh, English Defence League and UKIP, have had some popularity. And in this respect, it's striking what we see in the 2017 manifesto. Where the Conservatives uh, were, seemed to attack, though they would of course deny this, views associated with Margaret Thatcher. So they attack untrammeled free markets and they offer a perhaps somewhat vague protection to people working in the gig economy. But it's also couched in language which is typically assumed to be a deviation from purer religion, and, uh, by which they mean purer politics, in English political discourse. There is an explicit rejection of the cult of selfish individualism. The assumption here is that religion or a broad church is better and more communal. In other words, the language of religion is being used to support a kind of nativism and a promise of economic protectionism whilst isolating certain minorities. And this may sound a little bit familiar to the admittedly more abrasive rhetoric coming from contemporary American political discourse. And this looked from, well, at least from the perspective of hard electoral scheming to be a winning ploy before May's somewhat problematic election campaign. Now, according to YouGov polling published in March of this year, the overwhelming majority would still have voted the same way in the EU referendum. However, what this polling also revealed 
was that there was a significant majority of people, 69%, who thought that the government should just accept Brexit and just go ahead with it. Only 21% against. 49% were confident in May's negotiation skills and 52% thinking her proposals, whatever they may have been, were positive for Britain. Only 15% of people thought Parliament should vote on whether we should accept a deal or not. Now, my Facebook feed is full of liberal academics who all thought that um, Brexit should be overturned, taken to Parliament and all this. They were not representative of the country, perhaps no surprise. Similarly, a cluster of anti-immigration, anti-EU, anti-political establishment views uh, have been consistently popular among a section, only a section, of older working class voters, while anti-Islam, anti-Muslim feeling has been prominent in polling for years, particularly, again, among older voters. And by older voters, this is 45 and up, which makes me young, of course. Uh, as, as well as, oh, but don't worry, in a couple of years I'll be a bigot. Uh, as well as being uh, pervasive in the press. These qualified pro-Brexit and anti-immigration and anti-Muslim tendencies appeared to be reflected in the May 2017 local elections where the Conservatives performed strongly, seemingly absorbing the anti-EU UKIP votes on the right and the slim 52-48 referendum split becoming a distant memory. Now, based on such statistics, some analysts were confident in their predictions of the May landslide. However, such statistics are actually complicated. People, for instance, may respond to such questions, but may not prioritise, say, a disdain for Islam when voting, or they may not even have as much interest in Brexit other than having an opinion. Such predictions were also based on the not unreasonable assumption that an older generation would dominate voting in the election. Now, such, but what such predictions missed was the flip side and, uh, to such statistics, where a younger generation are far less likely to be hostile to Islam and immigration, whilst also being affect by, affected by cuts in education and precarious working patterns. In this sense, Corbyn is often something of an alternative, as appears to be reflected in what seems to be the return of two-party politics in the election. Now, the development of Corbynism also foregrounded related understandings of religion and the Bible. On his victory as Libra, leader of the Labour Party, Corbyn immediately began referencing the Bible. In his major television interview on the eve of the 2015 Labour conference, Andrew Marr began explaining who John the Baptist was. But Corbyn immediately interjected, saying, I know perfectly well who he was, and I am very familiar with the Bible. I was brought up with the Bible. Now, this is where I think Corbyn is fully aware of the importance of this source of cultural and political authority. Indeed, Corbyn has been making regular reference to the parable, or rather allusion, I think, to the parable of the Good Samaritan, including in his victory speech in 2015, in his interviews with Andrew Marr, and his speeches at the Labour Party conference. He's used it to promote his distinctive stance on welfare, come back to this picture in a moment, no worries. Um, we don't pass by on the other side of those people rejected by an unfair welfare system. We don't pass by on the other side while the poor lie in the gutter. Um, almost certainly a dialogue with Thatcher is at play here. But the Good Samaritan was also used to connect Corbyn with a specifically British or English socialism, a connection typical of his mentor, Tony Benn. It's not for that reason that the biblical allusion in his conference speech came shortly after the somewhat manufactured outrage levelled at Corbyn for not seeing the national anthem at a Battle of Britain memorial service. So he said, solidarity and not walking by on the other side of the street when people are in trouble. The shared majority British values that are the fundamental reason why I love this country and its people. And all the rallies you may have seen on TV or perhaps even attended, um, Corbyn has referenced this, he keeps referencing walking by on the other side, we will not walk by on the other side. Very, very consistently uses it. By the way, I put this to, to remind me, this is, um, there are all sorts of weird and wonderful memes about Corbyn making the rounds. And all the allegations that he's a Stalinist, a communist, a terrorist, have been used by uh, younger voters 
and as a, as a positive thing, and they've joked around it, ironically. And this is not, was not being noticed by the press, not occasionally was, but not the levels of popularity these things had. The 2015 general election completely overestimated social media. This election completely underestimated it. And these were hugely popular. There was an editorial in one of the papers that said the Daily Mail seemed to be out of kilter for once. And it said it was, and I think rightly saying it was firing analog bullets in a digital age. Uh, the, and and the, even the, the humour is just, was missed on an older generation as well. This was going on, um, there was a lot of activity around this. And incidentally, lots of Jeremy Corbyn as Jesus stuff was being, was being done as well. JC, he's got the right initials. Now, what's also significant about this is it tells us what Corbyn does not represent. Now, as I said before, the Good Samaritan is probably the most common biblical illusion in English party politics, English based party politics today. Uh, and, it's the bat and it's present in the battle for the soul of the Labour Party and cross party views on militarism. David Cameron, for instance, alluded to the example of the Good Samaritan to justify any future military intervention against ISIS in his promotion of British values and the state monopoly on violence. We cannot just walk by, walk on by if we are to keep this country safe. We have to confront this menace and we will do so in a calm, deliberate way but with an iron determination. In his speech supporting the bombing of Syria, Hilary Benn, then the most high profile Labour frontbencher, hostile to Corbyn, justified intervention with the claim we never have and we never should walk by on the other side of the road. So the very same parable and the very same sentiment within the parable can be read to come to exactly the opposite position on military intervention, which shows how exegesis no doubt is driven by a given political ideology while the biblical text simultaneously provides the authority. But this use of the Bible also involves how Islam is understood. In mainstream English political discourse since Blair, true Islam, as I said, is assumed to be compatible with and supportive of the liberal democratic state. Perversion of Islam is understood to require to be the recipient of military attacks and the blame of the cause of political violence in North Africa, the Middle East, on the streets of London, Nice and Brussels. It's the one phrase used. Nothing else caused this other than a perversion of Islam. Now that must, I think there's fairly, you could, probably cynical reasons for continuing to use this phrase because um, the situation in the Middle East and uh, terror in this country is extremely complicated. But what the government, the only government doesn't want is any complicity of course. So the perversion of Islam for, uh, works quite nicely for this. Corbyn has also been using this phrase, the perversion of Islam, to discuss ISIS. But he uses it to come to the exact opposite conclusion. Because there's such a perversion of Islam, we shouldn't be funding Saudi Arabia. We cannot discuss with them. It's beyond the pale, according to Corbyn. Um, I haven't got the slide, sadly, but there is, uh, this has got some support of all places in northern Syria and British volunteer fighters out there who uh, you may have seen in the papers near the election were uh, with big banners and guns saying, vote Corbyn, smash ISIS. And they said, we agree entirely with Jeremy Corbyn on this. It's not about uh, Islam. They said, it's not even about the perversion of Islam. It's about Saudi Arabia. We don't want any talk of that. So you've got to vote for Corbyn. A vote for May would be a vote for Saudi Arabia and a vote against fighting ISIS in northern Syria. And there's a history of this over the past 18 months of fighters in northern Syria supporting Corbyn against Hillary Benn and against... David Cameron and against Theresa May. In this sense, I mean, these are Corbyn supporters in Northern Syria, which is very interesting, but it's another space been opened up uh, since the crash, I think, to the left of Corbyn still. Okay, now another significant development in uh, the use of language, let's just say religious language for now, in, uh, since the crash, but has been how do you deal with Jeremy Corbyn in the press? Now, of course, we all know that Jeremy Corbyn's had a particularly bad press. There's been a number of studies proving what I think was the obvious anyway. Uh, just to give you some flavour, Jeremy Corbyn welcomed the prospect of an asteroid wiping out humanity, tagged pigeon prejudice, 
and demanded a ban on Action Man toys. That was the headline. It wasn't written by one of the commenters in the sections. Uh, Corbyn abolished the army, the new leader's potty plan for world peace, Corbyn's plan to send Britain into Zimbabwe, etc., etc. There was another uh, that he was going to ban Christmas. Um, again, you've got to keep your critical distance and say this is very interesting and see what you can do with this. Um, but what's been interesting to me, at least, is what The Guardian have done. And The Guardian, as a number of studies show, have also been part of the attack on Corbyn. Uh, you may have seen recently a number of people saying, oh, I was wrong, I got this all wrong in, in The Guardian. Um, but they've been a, a real sustained attack on Corbyn, but they've been employing some very curious language. So the language regularly employed by The Guardian, by Guardian writers in their attacks, are things like, he's pharisaical. Puritan, sect, sect keeps coming up. Corbynism is a sect. Cult, again, another very popular one. Now, in relation to this, he was even compared with Charles Manson. Um, not exactly the same, but similar to Charles Manson. Okay? Uh, zealot, higher cause, apocalyptic tendency. And, and fairly regularly, this gets contrasted with the broad church. That's the Labour Party or the centre of uh, English political debate. Fundamentalism, it's another key term that's come up. C compared with ISIS, so this is momentum, Corbyn followers compared with ISIS. So one group, the kind of arts and crafts thing the Labour Party, the other one to establish the caliphate, yet somehow they're typologically similar. Uh, and occasionally, now, th this may be a surprise to you, I don't know, but um, we did a study on um, religion in the English press. And what we found, much to our surprise, is the English press is usually very positive towards religion. Um, in a very weak, as long as it's kind of weak, soppy, nicely liberal, doesn't have any strong views on anything, it's a terrific thing. Okay? What, um, but a sm only a small minority would be hostile, hostile to Christianity and religion per se. So the polytoimbies, Richard Dawkins. Vocal, but actually a very small minority compared to the reporting in the press. So, correspondingly, you do get occasional attacks on Corbyn as religious. Usually the idea is that it's somehow a deviation from religion or a deviation from a church, sect, cult, and so on. But occasionally people like Polly Toynbee, such as here, would say about Corbyn's followers, I envy their certainty, the way you can envy the religious and their delusions. Now, this was so common. Um, I mean, where on earth is this coming from? Well, it turns out there is actually a long, long tradition of political identification of anyone outside the kind of agreed consensus as <coughs> irrational, apocalyptic, sect-like, religious. And it's the notion that people who don't agree with the political centre are just irrational somehow, just like religious sects are deemed to be irrational. There's a long history of this. Uh, and also, it's regularly tied in with enthusiasm, anti-liberalism, and anti-capitalism. So when there's a threat to any of these kinds of things, to liberalism and capitalism, very constantly, we're talking about at least a couple of hundred years worth of tradition here, would use this label to denote the outsider. One of the curious things over the past week, though, uh, is when some of the Guardian writers have come back to Corbyn, or gone to Corbyn for the first time, they've started to embrace this language of, um, you know, uh, joyous, break this wonderful, you know, it's, it's hope, and, and, and I think it's indicative of the way the consensus in polit politics is shifting at the moment, that that can be employed, that sort of language they were using to criticise Corbyn, some of it can now be employed in support of him. That will be interesting to analyse a year from now. Now, would it be fair to leave out Tim Farron? <laughs> if you want to Google Tim Farron, you know, that was um, Now, Tim Farron um, is an interesting case. I mean, Theresa May's got the vicar's daughter thing going on, and somehow it works for her at least at one point. Corbyn's got the uh, right for Christian tradition. But Tim Farron seems to be dedicated, evangelical. And that's a problem, okay, from the perspective of media and mainstream politics. 
Now, what's he done? Well, he's certainly shifted Lib Dem rhetoric, I think, from Clegg, who was kind of just happy there to be in a multicultural setting with uh, different kind of religious people, with his Christmas hat on, talking about how wonderful our tradition is, but uh, don't we all get along, and isn't it terrific? But what um, Farron has done, I think, has really stressed the importance of welcoming refugees. He did this in his 2016 speech, um, in which in many ways you could say caught the tone of the Remainers. But as we now know, there was no significant Remainer boost that went to the Lib Dems. And if anything, it seems that Corbyn was the beneficiary. Um, nevertheless, there is one aspect associated with Farron, rather perhaps against Farron, which does tell us something about English political discourse and its construction of religion and the Bible that's still there, present. As his 2016 Christmas address showed, Tim Farron is, I think for a post Thatcher politician, unusually forthright in his Christian beliefs. Though he doesn't usually stray too far from general liberal constructions of Christianity in the Bible. So, to give you a quote, uh, but you do know what, as a Christian, I think Christmas is about God who gave himself up for us and came to earth in order to do that, who urges us to follow him and to believe that we should do to others what we have done to ourselves. Slightly more confessional than certain politicians, but still the content isn't too far away from anyone else. And I think there are good reasons why Farron wants to keep certain controls when he opens his Bible, because he has to deal with the question about whether he thinks homosexuality, or more precisely, homosexual sex, is a sin. Now, it's very possible that he did think it was a sin, perhaps he still does. Um, but this is not the sort of thing a, a political leader of a party would readily admit outside UKIP, and perhaps the DUP, of course. Uh, Farron, therefore, made a classic liberal distinction, noted favourably by some activists and cross-party MPs I interviewed. So he made the distinction between his personal Christian morality and his public political liberalism. So his public political liberalism tolerates other groups and individuals irrespective of whether he finds them personally agreeable. And standard liberal position. Uh, for Farron, this was crucial to him being both a Christian and a liberal, big L and little L. Problem is, of course, that distinction is far too nuanced for the British press. You either are for it or you're against it or you're a hypocrite. Okay, that's the logic of the British press. Now, this for Farron, um, Farron went on to claim that we are all sinners to get around the problem of potential media condemnation. And this was seen in his particularly difficult Channel 4 news interview on the topic shortly after becoming leader. Farron's approach was typical enough, actually, in political discourse, and he did something that both Blair and Obama, as well as Russell Brand, by the way, did. And that would be a more, and I'm using this in scare quotes, a more liberal part of the Bible gets stressed over a more seemingly illiberal part. So Farron, in the case of Farron, when he was confronted by the interviewer with the seemingly illiberal Leviticus 18, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female, it's an abomination. The solution for Farron was to point to Jesus instead and a favoured biblical passage more amenable to contemporary liberalism, Matthew 7, verse 3. And this is Farron's wording. You don't pick out the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when there is a plank in your own. Now, one Liberal Democrat uh, activist I spoke to said that there was much support within the party membership for Farron. And by making a familiar move to a more palatable aspect of the Bible, Farron was deemed to be particularly strong on issues of social justice. And uh, activists said that this was a good thing and perceived to be a good thing in the party. Nevertheless, the presence of Liberal constraints on Farron's public presentation of Christianity was effectively confirmed by politicians I've interviewed, and notably ones from different perspectives. One MP from a different party told me that Farron handled the situation well, while another wished, Far wished Farron could be more explicit in his views, but claimed that the problem of keeping his party on side and secularism made it difficult for Farron. Now, interestingly here, secularism is constructed as pro-homosexuality or homosexual sex, and religion is constructed as anti-homosexuality and homosexual sex. By way of contrast, a senior politician, 
from a different party and former front bencher thought Farron should simply oppose homophobia and support homosexual sex, or else he must be deemed irrelevant to politics. There is likely to be an allusion to this sort of thinking when it was reported from the 2015 Labour Party conference when Angela Eagle was said to have criticised Tim Farron for being an evangelical Christian who believes in the literal truth of the Bible at a time of a huge revival of fundamentalist religious belief. But he just doesn't want to talk about it a lot because he knows how much it will embarrass his own party, she said. In each of these cases, different though they all are, there is an assumption that being open in opposition to homosexuality was not an option for a leader of one of the main parties and not an option for a public presentation of religion or the Bible. Despite such pressures, Farron's dealing with this issue early in his leadership by effectively refusing to comment on the problematic biblical verses seemed to have worked for him, in that the issue didn't haunt the party until the general election. By this time, pressure on Farron to come clean about his compatibility with a more acceptable liberalism presumably weighed heavy, as first he said that being in a gay relationship is not a sin. Now, that's very interesting because you can kind of still get away with that, of course, uh, from a certain uh, theological perspective. But then, once the news, uh, once the press had, dis uh, had found out that this wasn't quite the issue at heart, they came back to him with another question about homosexual sex, and then Farron had to admit this is not a sin. Very interesting. It, finally, the kind of liberal constraints got to him, and he came down on the idea that he had to, it was not a sin. Now, whether he actually believed that, well, it seemed likely a year ago, I would have bet my house that Farron thought it was a sin. But the political constraints weighed heavy. So there you have it. There are three, there are plenty, but three main tendencies at play in English di political discourse since the 2008 crash. A kind of nativist, or ethno-nationalist, whatever term you want, reading of the Bible. A kind of Corbyn, the return of socialist readings of the Bible with Corbyn, with an emphasis on welfare state and non-intervention. And a vague liberalism at play across parties. Now, as this liberalism cuts across parties, it's the other two that are the new distinctive ways of understanding the Bible and religion. But they've hardly crystallised. With Corbynism seemingly in the ascendancy and socially liberal Tories em emboldened after May's problematic election results and the emergence of the DUP in English political discourse, the potential for more to happen before the ideological dust settles ought to be clear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll take some questions. Yes, I think uh, there's a... Um, now, this is a question about, uh, it was the Alistair Campbell thing that, uh, when he said about Blair, when Blair was asked a question on uh, religion, Alistair Campbell shut down the interview by saying, we don't do God. Now, he's often defended this by saying it's not meant to be an anti-religious comment, but it's meant to be, we don't want to talk about this because it's a problem. Uh, and related to that, the kind of, what's the lay of the land in quoting the Bible and using the Bible. The Alistair Campbell comment, um, I, th I, think he was, I think he was telling the truth when he uh, was later said about this, that he wanted to shut, he wanted to shut down the question because it was a problem. He was always wanting to make sure Tony Blair didn't go overboard. 
from his perspective. Tony Blair really wanted to employ the language of, he wanted to say, God bless Britain in, in, in the eve of the Iraq war. Well, only the Queen technically, I think, can do this, can't she? Um, but but the, in contrast to America. Um, and, and David Cameron, as you said, um, did seem to be quite open about this in a way that perhaps Tony Blair couldn't. If you look at them both, they probably balance out Blair and Cameron on their uses of the Bible. Um, the problem is, is how much do you use? Tony, if Tony Blair went in for it too much, he didn't have, for some reason, it didn't work for him, the kind of credible side of it. People mocked him as soon as he used it. And there was an interview, I think, with the Sunday Telegraph in 1996, where he just he got a bad headline, and Alistair Campbell said, look, this is a problem. And Campbell would often... Campbell, of course, is, a, is an atheist and, and not really got not grounded in this tradition. He'd cross out the religious bits of Blair's speech, but of course, as he didn't see half of the illusions, they still managed to get through <laughs> Alistair Campbell's <laughs> red pen. Um, now, I think Campbell, from, uh, from the perspective of winning votes, was probably did the right thing. This isn't an endorsement of Campbell in any way. But as from that perspective, it's because some of the work done, uh, I've done some of this myself, um, on the ground with people, when people, you show them a politician using the Bible, I've shown, I've done this, and they don't believe, you think, first of all, they thought I was lying, they thought I'd made it up and attributed to David Cameron that he was saying all these things about the Bible. Interestingly, it was not a hostility to the Bible that was the problem. People just thought, well, whatever, it's, it's a good book, it's nice, it's got good things in it. Um, it was the user, it was deemed that politicians will twist this and use it for bad ends. Now that seems to be, uh, from what did we have, a repeated pattern, I think, that people, uh, uh, significant parts of the electorate don't want you to be using the, the Bible. What was also interesting is they never heard of Cameron using this. They don't know what the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible was or anything like this. So it worked at the same time. So on one hand, sand, it wasn't getting through to uh, parts of the electorate. On the other hand, it gets through to certain parts of the electorate who do go to Christian websites and will see that David Cameron cites the Bible or something like this. Um, so you've got to somehow get that balance right. And I think both Cameron and Blair, or the people around them, managed that. Um, so David Cameron had, the, I think, quite an important, from his perspective, uh, notion, and, and all due apologies, Rob, that uh, his faith comes and goes. Uh, like, was it Magic FM in the Chilterns or whatever is the analogy he used. Um, sufficiently vague, not to be threatening, but also a nod in the direction of the church and all this kind of thing. So that's the balance that's, that you've kind of got to keep in English politics. And Theresa May has, for what it, uh, has managed to keep this as well, you know, the vicar's daughter thing. I think that probably works because the vicar's daughter, of course, isn't doing all the strange religious -y stuff, you know, like the the, the actual contents of the Bible or the, you know, the, uh, anything that would, the English press wouldn't understand. The daughter, in terms of stereotypes, will be helping out and doing practical things and, and so on and so forth. So it works for her. works for Corbyn, he uses it in a general, vague way. And that's the way it works in English political discourse, it seems. But general and vague. And that's why Farron has had so many difficulties, because we all know that Farron believes far more than this, and he's desperate not to let this out. And probably rightly so from a pure political perspective because it would be just worse, it would be terrible for him if he said, you know, if he said homosexuality is a sin, then you wouldn't hear the end of it uh, in the press. So you've, it's keeping that very real vagueness about it in the political discourse. And there's a, you, you don't want to lose the Christian vote, I think is the logic here. Um, there's not, it's not like the states, there isn't a big Christian vote to be won, but at the same time, why you don't want to lose them either. And I think that's part of what's going on here as well as historic traditions in each party. The demographics you mentioned, I think, are important. Whether this will matter in a generation or two is an interesting question. There was a, a survey published fairly recently where it uh, stated that the numbers of people in the country are estimated based on uh, the surveys that we carried out. Um, the tick box saying Church of England has gone up from, I think, the 16.3% to 17.1%. And the Walsh survey said that that down to nationalism. Well, it's, it's not for me to say in a way, but this is, this is a phenomenon that keeps happening in different ways. So there's a, um, from the British Social Attitudes Survey, it was something like 23% identified British or Englishness with, the church of, uh, with Christianity. 
Uh, and there's a lot of people who identify as Church of England who have probably not been to church, to church in decades or sometimes. But then that is something that's happening. It's happening most worryingly on the far right. Um, the corresponding statistic with this is that people who go to church would tend to have want to downplay the nationalist side because it, uh, perhaps more heavily into the theology, so have a more internationalist outlook uh, that the church should be inclusive of all different kind of uh, nations and, and, and so on. So the, the, there's something happening with church-going Christians and people who do this. How the church would engage in them, it's a very difficult question. I mean, because if, if a church leader comes out and says this, that this is an abomination or something like this, well, immediately the far right will say, well, this is a disgrace, you've got to get rid of them. Um, they stand down and all this. Farage, when uh, acting, just if I can label Farage as far right, which I will just for convenience sake right now. Um, uh, when uh, Justin Welby was saying uh, uh, things on, uh, relating to Brexit and poverty and things, Farage is straight away tweeting, what an idiot he is, uh, and so on. So I, I'm, I'm fortunate I haven't got a very good solution for what the church can do because I think um, uh, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't on this because uh, then again it's always good to have the right kind of enemies, isn't it? If the far right are attacking the, uh, attacking the Church of England, it can't be that bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> Several times, or many times in your talk, you talked about politicians using the Bible and that was a recurring phrase. And I think I got quite sad because it's seems like what you've been talking about is politicians using the Bible rather than the Bible in any way shaping our politics, mm. which means we've drifted a really long way from, say, Shaftesbury and, mm. you know, the sort of roots of our welfare state. Um, and they've been using it in many different ways and not very informed mm -hmm. ways. Um, do you think that's a reasonable yeah. comment? Yeah, um, uh, I was kind of looking for a neutral term, but I think you're probably right um, to pick up on it, actually. Um, I, I didn't want to make a judgment as such on whether this was a right or wrong view of it, but I think, in one sense, this is, this is not detailed engagement with uh, a given tradition in most cases. Tony Blair, I think, whether this is right or wrong, I think he really believed and he really did read up on this and he was constantly reading various popular theology to the point that he really thinks he's an expert. Thatcher thought she was an expert on the Bible, by the way. And she was, she was condemning the non-experts reading the Bible, which was interesting. Let's just use that first again. Um, but it, I think, broadly speaking, it's true. Um, the, the, there's no, no, signif not, no significant stats for what politicians believe in terms of religious affiliation and things like this. But the Methodist tradition, for instance, is nothing like what it was in the Labour Party. Cat Smith, for instance, is a practicing Methodist still. She certainly does... Um, I mean, it, it was the Bible and so on that brought her into politics, actually. Um, you know, that came first. And then she suddenly found, she, one way or another, discovered that she should join the Labour Party and, and so on. So there are individuals like this uh, still around. But I think a, some, in, in, in broad senses, a lot of it is inherited political tradition. So um, May, Cameron, uh, even Corbyn in his own way would be using a tradition they know perhaps even subconsciously at times, just simply carrying on that language and tradition. Perhaps they're not always aware they're using this language at times, whereas some, like a Cat Smith, I think, is very conscious about the use of this language. But it's not like it was 100 years ago, and it's certainly not like it was you know, um, after the English Civil War or something like this, where you can make you know, allusions to some of the most obscure, to us would be the most obscure parts of the Bible, and everyone would understand this. Uh, that's good. Those days have gone, and, and I think the comment on, uh, that was made about shifting um, church affiliation and things like this is important because um, whether anyone will understand any allusions in, or even bother using the Bible in a couple of generations, I don't know, but it's not looking too healthy for it, I don't think. I was supposed to say something about Gordon Brown mm. and particularly the uh, debt campaign in 2000. Yes. Yes, the, the example, Gordon Brown is an interesting example um, in terms of, I think, what he represents. So, I mean, the, the church-state relationship in the 80s was antagonistic, and Thatcher wanted this, I think. Uh, by the time uh, you get to sort of mid-90s, that's coming to an end. I mean, Gordon Brown comes from a different church tradition. Um, and politicians being directly involved with this uh, Jubilee campaigns and things was, I think, a significant moment. 
and you can get this cross party I think to some extent. Um, this was partly to uh, I think to co-opt a kind of soft social democratic Christianity into the rhetoric but Brown, um, Brown does, uses a kind of leftist tradition and I think that's part of it but he, he shifts it like Tony Blair did so for instance when he would talk to the city of London he would invoke Win Stanley. Now Win Stanley is almost always invoked on the left as you know one of the great socialists of the English tradition. For Brown he was there as a great example of individualism and entrepreneurialism which was really quite a distinctive move in the history of the left. And I think there's been uh, and Brown was following what Blair did was to co-opt some of that traditional language that would have been associated with socialism but now really um, reflecting the move that New Labour did towards let's just call it Thatcherism for the sake of convenience. Bob Brown's an interesting figure in this respect because he does hark back to the Church of Scotland and that kind of upbringing, but he does very similar things to what Tony Blair did, unsurprisingly, but I think. Yes, this is, um, this is inter another interesting move in a way because it's uh, kind of the emperor has no clothes moment, I think, in one sense. Um, whether it, I mean, in one sense, of course he's right. I mean, you know, each tradition has got violence in it um, and each person who uses violence will almost certainly have identified with that tradition. So whether it's a, a Christian using violence or whether it's a Muslim using violence, they would identify as Christian and Muslim. So in one sense, who are we to say it's a perversion or not? Okay, so there is, I think, you know, there is a perfectly good sense to what, what it says here. The other thing is, you, know, you have to be a bit cynical about the way politicians use it, that's pretty mild, um, in that behind the scenes, things are a little different. So um, one government, former government advisor, I asked him about this whole thing, why do you keep saying this is a perversion of Islam? And he said, well, you've got to think that uh, a leading politician has heard of a terror attack and they've got next to no time to respond to it, so they just need an instant soundbite that somehow doesn't isolate the Muslim community and deals with the terrorist attack. Now there is that, I think, I still think this is, I, I would agree with uh, the Archbishop on this, that, um, that it's problematic because by repeating this perversion of Islam, you are still targeting the Muslim community all the time. And of course it deflects any potential complicity. Yeah, but behind the scenes is also interesting. There's a number of people who, I mean, there's some awful stuff going on behind the scenes. I think some fairly clueless stuff going behind the scenes on Islam. But there are a couple of people who do work in government who are very, very good. I mean, people who uh, do field work and things like this. I mean, that's not necessarily a guarantee it'll be any good, of course. But some of them do know what's going on, but have said, but I can't, uh, I can only advise. The government will do whatever the government will do, um, irrespective of, you know, details, evidence, and things like this. And it's just cliched what the response is all the time. Um, uh, I noticed on the other up that we were sent around that uh, you also teach on first century politics. And, and oh, yeah. I wonder yeah. if you might draw any parallels for us about the early churches' mm. response to the political situation mm -hmm. and perhaps the church's response to the political situation today. Um, yeah, this is my previous life, as in a couple of years ago. Um, working on things like historical Jesus, and origins of Christianity and that kind of thing. Um, I think, I mean, I, methodologically I find two areas very similar. I mean, obviously there's huge amounts of difference in time, culture, place, etc. But I think 1930s Galilee, for instance, was undergoing some significant, or 1920s Galilee was undergoing some significant changes. Uh, there were building projects which were affecting traditional patterns of life, whether for good or ill, but the reactions you get um, apocalyptic tendencies, to, to coin a phrase, uh, and you get um, uprisings, you get uh, different new religious, and I use that term very loosely, movements, such as the Jesus movement, I think. Um, and I think what, it, I mean, again, I don't know quite 
how to give it as a lesson for the church, but I, what, maybe this is that whatever we think of some of the wild and wonderful things of the first century, what it reflects is some deep-rooted, problematic socio-economic issues, uh, whatever level. Whether the responses we don't like, whether we like them, or whether we think they're crazy or whatever, there's something there that is... Ref the reason they're happening, part of the reason they're happening is because of some serious, long-standing, deep-rooted social inequality and all this kind of thing. And I think you can say the same for today in that sense. Since the 2008 crash, it's opened a lot of this up. Why are we getting the far right becoming a bit more prominent and influential? Well, it, you know, racism is a part, no doubt. But it's also there, there is a uh, clear, and again, plenty of studies done on this, social economic issues are fueling some of this as well. So I think addressing those kinds of issues in both cases should be the lesson to take from that. Do you think that the next Seriously, I mean, I don't know what to think on this. It's, um, if we give the analogy of uh, a separation from church and state from a Western country, we would say America. Um, now, if you wanted to be, take the hard political angle on this, you would say, let's renew it so we keep a leash on the Church of England, we keep a leash on religion. Alternative is we get America, where we really don't have a separation of church and state, where... Um, uh, the influence on politics, I think, has been profoundly negative. Whereas in this country, I mean, I think, interestingly, you find, I know plenty of people who are sort of hard and secularists actually conflicted on this because, um, because the church is not deemed to be a bad thing in this sense, because it has a kind of, how do I put this politely, it's not muted influence, but still an influence that's not necessarily a bad thing in uh, political discourse and the Lords and so on. Um, I, I, don't know, I, I don't have a strong opinion on this. Um, um, you've asked a very difficult question, and I suspect uh, on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a million dollar question in a way. Is for some reason, some people have that kind of perceived to have that authenticity with it. Um, the problem for the church is it will be seen to be you're pushing it on us. It won't necessarily be hostility to the Bible or anything, but it'll be you're pushing it on us. Whereas Corbyn doesn't have that problem. Um, it's somehow getting a figure with that, that sort of credibility who can talk kind of in let's say popularist tones to use a different uh, kind of phrase who can get uh, who can galvanize people like that but it would have to be very very light touch i think uh, in, in one sense because if you start preaching sermons and things i think it, it won't work um and i think this is being shown from studies on the ground people there was the example of is, is it i think it's swindon when it's the bible society one of the big problems they face is people don't want the damn thing you know i don't, don't feel good but if they may own a Bible, they may buy a Bible, but it's the, the act of giving is deemed to be forcing it on people. Uh, and this idea of things being forced upon people in political discourse is huge. And I think the Corbyn thing, that sort of light touch, popularist rally thing, is somehow working. It somehow doesn't, it's not being perceived to be throwing, um, sort of shoving religion onto them, but it's just being weaved into the speeches in a, in a way that's not a problem. And I think part of it is that he does also put himself into that tradition of that sort of radical tradition of Christianity, which interestingly is, on, again on the ground, is less of a problem. When you start saying, if you say the Bible is about English nationalism and all this, or it's about democracy, people will laugh. Politicians do, but they'll laugh. If you start saying the Bible is about helping people, not walking around inside, those kind of basic ethical things, you'll find that people will probably agree quite strongly with that kind of thing. And it's that kind of way in, and that might be for people with kind of, you know, I suspect most people here with, you know, very high-level theological training, you've learned all the kind of key theologians, 
that's not necessarily going to work. It's going to be that kind of, sort of moral, ethical Christianity, I think, which would be more likely to have traction. But, I mean, there's, there's contradictions here, because in certain parts of London, of course, uh, things like uh, charismatic Christianity has, has boomed, you know. I mean, there are certain uh, uh, variants here, but, you know, in that those sort of in, in niches. But in, in this kind of context, that, I think that ethical, moral thing kind of has some perch. Well, this is this is interesting because I mean it's kind of they keep this is not the first time this has happened in the press. They're having to deal with this notion, and it's they can't, it's complicated for them because they they're seeing a lot of people using it jokingly, ironically, and and I don't think a, a generation who are running things like the Telegraph and Mail know what to do with this. It's not there's almost like two different levels of discourse, and it's generational uh, in many ways. The other problem they've got, the Mail have got, for instance, is the Mail have consistently praised. Um, sort of a soft socialist Christianity um, because it's ethical, it's against you know, gambling, it's you know, that kind of thing. And they can't have a go at it now because it's there in their own narrative that this is a good thing. You know, the real heart of the Labour Party is Methodism, not Marx, from their perspective and, uh, and others. And, and so, again, this is, they, can't, they can't attack it.